Good morning, Park Avenue. Thank you for joining us this morning. We want to start our service out with a few little announcements for you. As we go into the fall, sometimes we need some reminding. Thought I'd take some time and do that with you. One of those, one of the things that we've, well, we've always known, but really discovered during COVID time is the importance of communication. And, uh, and, and we've done our best and are trying to do our best to communicate with you as many different ways as we can through this video and also through your church email. That church email is really important. And, uh, and there's a number, of, a number of times where we have something important for you to learn or say, like whether it's a report from a missionary or the people we're praying for this week or the Bible reading plan that was attached to your email this week or any number of details. And I know that it's really easy to skip because I've done that. Sorry, Laura Lynn, I definitely have. I just quickly scan it and I don't think about it and I just put it away. But oftentimes I've found that I've missed something that I didn't even know was in the email and someone's asked me. So if you could please take time to read through that email, there will be some repeat information for sure, but there will also be new information every week. Take time to read that email. Take time to give me or Joe or Larry a call if you have a question. Communication is so important. We're trying to do that as well as we can. We'd love to do it better. So please uh, read that email. Let us know if there's anything that we're forgetting or that you would like to see or say, and, uh, and we'll do our best to put together the very best communication that we can for you. Uh, another thing is that's in that email is our encouragement for you to join a gathering or a house church. Please do join one. Uh, we know that there's several of us who haven't joined. There's some people that, that have been away or for whatever reason have said no, and we understand that, but we would love to plug you in as soon as we can. So please give Joe or Larry or I or the church office a call, and uh, we will get you plugged into a group as soon as possible. And then the final thing is that in your emails this week, there, is, there was some information about adult Sunday school. We are trying to get that back together uh, in some way, shape, or form. Right now, John Renouf is teaching, and, uh, and the details, again, are in that email. So do check that out. We want to begin learning together about the Word and about the Lord as much as we can. So check that out. Uh, why don't we pray before we start our service this morning? Lord Jesus, we're so grateful that you've brought us together again in your name to study your word, to worship you, to fellowship together. Lord, I pray that as we go forward today, that you would bless us, that you would fill us with excitement and enthusiasm for what you're going to do. And uh, we just thank you for this privilege of getting together. In Jesus' name, amen. One more thing I forgot. I wanted to share with you a little bit, just a quick thought about how harvest has gone. Uh, last week, we preach, I preached from the tractor. And, uh, and this past week, Harvest really got going. Spent about 40 or 45 hours in the tractor this week. And I struggled spiritually. Uh, I struggled in my connection with the Lord. And I don't know what it is about just being in the tractor, but, but my brain sometimes is really active, but a lot of times is kind of dead and I'm filling it with stuff off a screen or whatever. And, and I just wondered, farmers, I wonder if there's a way that, uh, that you could encourage your crew or, or lead your crew in some kind of spiritual talk, whether it's over the radio or if it's a podcast you all listen to, or maybe it's the Park Ave Bible reading plan that we're going through. I just noticed that, that it's so easy to flip on my phone or flip on something that is of no value. I wonder if there's a way that we can bring some spiritual value to our harvest time. Um, obviously, that's not a command from me, but just maybe a suggestion uh, that, that maybe we're able to redeem some of our time in the tractors and, uh, and redeem some of the, the, the many hours that we spend just kind of staring at screens. Uh, just, just kind of my thoughts, and I uh, just wanted to leave that with you. Good morning, Park Avenue Bible Church. We're so excited to be worshiping with you again this Sunday. We hope that you had a good week, that the kids are doing well in school and farming is going smoothly. We're excited for you to join us today. Let's bow in our word in a word of prayer before we start. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to meet together in house churches. Thank you that you've given us the ability to gather together and sing praises to your name and to receive the word of God through a message, Lord. And I pray that um, you would just guide this service, that your hand would be upon it, and that our hearts would be softened and open to what you have to teach us today. May the songs that we sing be glorifying to you, Lord. In your name, amen.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. so much that you are holy, that you are worthy to be praised, Lord, and we bless your name. Lord, thank you for who you are and that you have redeemed us because we have cried out to you, Lord. In your name, amen. Good morning again, everyone. I know this might seem like an awkward cut in into the, the music worship package, um, but we want to take some time to talk about uh, our Bible readings. We uh, distributed a Bible reading plan last week, so hopefully you've all had the chance to read. Um, I've really enjoyed it this last week. We've actually given the same plan to our youth, and so this last Thursday I was able to talk with them about what some stuff they've been reading and some of my leaders and just talk about, and the, for them to be able to share and and me to be like, have all that stuff fresh in my memory and be like, oh yeah, I remember that. And so it's been really encouraging for me and I hope that you've been able to talk about uh, with other believers this week about what you've been reading and learning and what stood out to you. Um, but I just wanted to share one thing that stood out to me and it's actually from the same passage that Phil's gonna be preaching on right away. But thankfully, he didn't steal too much of my thunder so I'm, I'm gonna still be able to share it. Um, so if you remember in Acts 2, the, like the Holy Spirit comes down onto all the believers and they go out and they speak in a whole bunch of different languages. But what stood out to me was in chapter 12. So we have the people coming and they're talking about how like we're all from these different areas and yet we still hear you talking. And it says they're speaking of the mighty acts of God. And it got me thinking, if I was told to just go out into Melfort and talk about the mighty acts of God, what would I say? Like, do I have stuff right at the front of my mind that'd be like, oh yeah, God did this and this and this and this and just be able to go on and on and on about how amazing and wonderful the things that God has done for me? Or do I kind of forget about them? Because if I sit down and think, I'll be like, oh yeah, I could talk about this. And oh yeah, maybe, maybe this. But I don't really keep them at the front of my mind that I can just rattle them off. And I know they had the Holy Spirit that just descended on them, but so do we. And so... That was just an, a, a challenge that I had for myself. Um, but what about you? What have you learned? So we'd like you to take some time in your small groups to talk about what stood out to you. What are some stuff that, I don't know, maybe you can encourage each other with. What are some stuff that maybe you got challenged by or that you don't understand? So this is something we're going to try and do every week because um, we really think that it's valuable for us to share with each other what God has been showing us. And there's so much encouragement uh, and blessing that can come as we do that. So take some time to share with the group what you've read this week.
Last week, Sunday, the celebration service, I was so encouraged by your worship. Worshiping with hearts that were so hungry for Christ and eagerly worshiping him and praying without ceasing, it sounded like an army in here. As I think about Phil's theme about returning to Christ and becoming the church who God has called us to be, I tried to look for a Bible verse, but there were so many Bible verses about returning. God promises to restore, to heal, to lift us up, and to show us compassion when we return to him. He wants us to return to him. He's calling and seeking those who will walk with him. Those who surrender and who are obedient will experience peace, joy, and hearing his still small voice.
on him one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working is the desire of our hearts that we would cry out to you with yes I will that we would return to you that our hearts would yearn for you Lord and that you would continue to call us back to you and redeem us Lord thank you for who you are Lord and I pray for the message that's about about to be preached now I pray that your kingdom would be furthered because of it Lord and that our hearts would be softened to receive it in your name amen all right hello again And uh, now we're going to study the word together. If you can take your Bible and flip to the book of Acts, uh, that would be fantastic. We're going to study the book of Acts today. Uh, This week, this past week, we've been taught, we talked about how we are going to be taking the year to focus on the theme return, uh, exploring what doing church the way that God wants it to happen will look like versus how humans want it to happen. Last year, we spent the whole year studying the book of Mark, and and it was a great year. And I don't know if it was a long year or not. If it was, thanks for your patience. But I just loved looking at the way that the, the way that Jesus worked, the way what he did, and the compassion that he felt for people, and the miracles that he did, and the heart that he had for obeying his Father. It was such a great year of looking at looking at Jesus. And you may or may not remember this, but one of the things that Mark tries to do when he writes his book is to get you to answer the question, what are you going to do about Jesus? And that was a question that, that I had to wrestle with as a pastor is, okay, we, we spent the whole year looking at Mark. What are we going to do with that next? What are we going to do with Jesus? And, and so, 
you know, that plus COVID and all of the stuff that we've been thinking about has equaled taking a year, the next year, to study the origins and the early history of the church, what they did well, what they did poorly, hopefully learning what we can do here and now in 2020 to be a group of believers that pleases God as a opposed to a group of believers that simply does church for ourselves or, or lives to please ourselves. We're going to study the church as an entity, as a group, but we'll also look at it, what it's like to be an individual believer in the church. We're going to look at a couple of epistles from uh, 1 John and, uh, and also from Titus uh, about what it's like to be an individual in the body of Christ. And, uh, and, and not only the capital C church, but also this church of Park Avenue and, uh, and, and the, the overall bride of Christ. It's going to be a really great year, and we're so excited to do this with you. Uh, to read the word together, to focus on discipling each other and reaching out to Melfort and to discover what it's like to be a church that pleases God. Why don't we pray and, and start our sermon off this morning? Lord, again, we thank you as we come to you for your word and for this chance to get to know you through it. Lord, may we be a people that knows you, not just knows about you. And may that knowledge motivate and excite us to spread the news of the gospel to Melfort and to the rest of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. So how many of you as parents remember the story of your kid's birth? You're probably looking at the screen and thinking, how could I not remember those days, right? Those are actually three of the most vivid memories that I have as a human, as the times that my kids were born. Interesting, actually, we've had a baby every single church we've been a part of. Uh, we, had, we had Maggie in Swift Current, we had Evie in Edmonton, and we had Hank here in, uh, in Melfort. And we're done having kids, so I think you're stuck with me. Sorry. Uh, but let me, tell you, let me tell you three facts about, about my kids, all right? Hank, the, the story of when Hank was born. Um, we were here in, in Melfort, and we went in for, uh, for a cesarean, and, uh, and the doctors were doing the operation, and, uh, and it, it, it was so crazy. Like, Jess and I were talking, and we were praying and getting ready for this huge event, and the doctors were working, and they were talking about what they watched on TV. Like, they said, hey, did you watch Lost last night? Oh, past the scalpel. And, oh, yeah, that was crazy. What happened there? And I'm going like... There's a baby being born. You're doing an operation. You can't talk about stuff like this, but they did. And then Henry was like born, and uh, and and I had forgotten we actually checked on Henry's gender. Like literally, we checked, and I didn't even believe the the tech. I was just like, he said, I suspect it's a boy. Like I suspect you're wrong. So I forgot about it. And then when we discovered Henry was a boy, I just shouted with joy. I was like, a boy! And the doctors jumped and the techs jumped and they all were like, they were still talking about it a couple of months when we brought Henry in to check. They couldn't believe that this dad was just lost his mind about having a boy. So with Evie, we were in Edmonton and it was a teaching hospital. So there were some students watching and that was kind of weird. And and I was walking around the hospital observing some things and was getting a little bit worried about getting into the, into the actual operation and about having the baby. And, but thankfully, the birth went really well. And we had this amazingly red-headed, blue-eyed, like really intense baby. She'd just look right at you and her hair was straight up in the middle and her eyes were just staring right into the back of my head. It was amazing. But the most intense story that we have is the story of Maggie. And, uh, and it was a long labor ending with an emergency C-section. Maggie got a couple of lungfuls, lungfuls of birth fluid on the way out, and she was turning blue, and then she was turning red. And, and it, was, it was one of the most intense times of my life. I was pacing, and I was crying, and I was praying, and the doctors were working fast and quietly. And, and all I could do is plead with the Lord for my child's life. And then all of a sudden, I heard that, I heard a really a loud cry and the doctors backed away and my, my daughter was there and she was the right color finally and, and she was breathing well and I experienced like the joy I think that Abraham had when he got his son back when he didn't have to kill his son it was incredible joy it was incredible relief God saved Maggie that first day she was alive and I was so grateful and I know for a fact that many of you if not all of you remember the details in vivid detail about the day your kids were born. 
And uh, because it's such an important day, right? It, in the beginning, it, it's something new and something amazing. And, and I wanted to ask you guys, moms and dads, if you're in small groups right now, would you be willing to share a story about what God did through the birth of your child? Would you be willing to share about what an amazing night, day that was with your group? If you are, just pause the video and, uh, and share with each other about how God was involved in the day of your kids being born. So I don't know if that's like a TMI discussion or what, but it's actually a really, really big thing in our lives to see how God was involved with the birth of our children. Uh, it's a hugely inspiring day when your kids are born. And today our passage is a hugely inspiring passage. It's a passage I'm very familiar with, one that I've visited and revisited since I became a pastor for sure, if not like my whole career as a Christian. And it's the story of the birth of the bride of Christ. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 to 13 together. <clears throat> On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like tongues or flames of fire appeared and settled on them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people for, are from all over Galilee, yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. This is an incredible passage, and there are so many things to notice. It's hard to do justice to them all, but we're going to try this morning. The first thing I notice right off the bat is that all the believers are meeting together in one place. And that stands out way more because we haven't met together in one place, all of us, for months, right? So we look at that, and I looked at that and I thought, lucky, like what an amazing thing to meet all together in one place. It stands out because we haven't been meeting together in one place. But it also stands out to me in a different way in that it was remarkable enough that they were meeting all together in one place that maybe they weren't able to meet all together in one place either, I mean, there was 120 of them before the Holy Spirit came. That's a big group. And I've been to Jerusalem. There aren't a lot of places for 120 people to gather and pray. And that's what they were doing, right? They were fervently engaged in prayer. They've been doing that for 50 days. Uh, Acts mentions, Acts 1 and 2 only mentioned two times and all the believers were together. The first time was when they elected Matthias to replace Judas as the 12th disciple. And, and the other time was, was now when the Holy Spirit comes. And, uh, and I just wanted to, I guess, take this time to highlight how special it is when the believers can get together in one place. And so October 25th, that's October 25th of this year, 2020, that's the next time we're getting together as a church. We've already got the event on our website. Take some time right now and go sign up. We're going to have two services again, uh, at 4.30 and 7 o'clock, please sign up, join us. It's a big deal when the church gets together. Let's get together and celebrate what God is doing in our lives, October 25th. And if you've been studying along in our reading plan this first week, you'll know that in, you'll have read this in Acts 1, but there's been some kind of prayer meeting going on for the believers for the last 50 days. Jesus left at, during Passover, and this is the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks, and that happens 50 days after Passover. 50 days. 
They've been having a prayer meeting straight for 50 days. <clears throat> These men and women believed so strongly in the Lord and in his promise to them that to, he said, stay in Jerusalem, right? Wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So they were constantly meeting and praying and waiting and praying and waiting and praying and waiting. Sometimes we do countdowns to Christmas, right? And I remember when I was a kid to think like 25 days. Are you serious? Like, oh, it takes so long. But at least I know it's coming. These men and women have no idea when the Holy Spirit is coming. They just know they need to wait and pray and wait and pray. And if there's something we can learn from that, it's that we need to pray and not give up. And we've been praying for a long time, many of us for like two years or one and a half or two years for someone in our life to get saved. All right, that's what those boxes that you saw were here when we were meeting together as a, as a body. And a lot of us have been praying and seeing no results, right? And it's, it's frustrating. I've talked to lots of you about how frustrating that is. But don't give up. God is working. And there's never a moment when he isn't working. And I know that we wish he would move faster. I mean, how many of us have said, God, give me patience and please hurry <laughs> there's, but there's never a moment when God isn't working. And I bet you these men and women were tempted to like get up and start telling people. But Jesus said, wait, wait until the Holy Spirit comes and then you can start to do things. And so I want you to take some time and discuss that. Is there a situation that you're growing impatient with? Is there a situation that you're getting discouraged about praying for because it's just taking so long? Would you be willing to share that with the group and maybe pray together as a group for that situation? Maybe it's people that are lost or, or a situation that you're just getting frustrated with. Take some time and pray about it and, and encourage one another. Pray and don't give up. Take some time now and do that. And now the waiting is over. The Holy Spirit comes. The men and women are waiting and praying, and then I can't even make the sound because it's like a sound of a tornado that arrives in this house, like the sound of rushing wind, the Bible says. Not wind itself, but this huge, cacophonous, tornado-like wind rushes into the house, and all of a sudden, these flames of fire appear over disciples' heads, and, and it looks like the fire is burning, and and they get so excited. And, and I, we need to figure out why they get so excited. It's not just because they start to speak in other kinds of tongues. It's because this is like one of the most symbolic and amazing things that happens in Acts 2. And that is that, that the, the new temple of the living God has been chosen and revealed that day. And that new temple is the human being. Like this, this is just so big, we can't miss it. When God's house was first built, it was temporary. It was just a tent. It was a really, really nice tent, but it was still just a tent. The Israelites built it in the desert and it was beautiful. It had all kinds of amazing, beautiful things, but it was temporary. And it was something they packed up and they moved on to the next location. But when they dedicated that tabernacle, like the first day, God himself came and sent fire out from the cloud and boom, hit that altar. And the altar began to burn the sacrifice and it just kept burning. The Israelites were instructed never to let that fire go out. God supplied that fire and it was a symbol of his presence. All right, so they did that for 440 years. They had that tabernacle going. And then after 440 years, Solomon built one of the most expensive and beautiful buildings ever created. And it was going to be a house for God. And it was, there was no more tents. Now it was a temple. And that was massive. Solomon sacrificed uncounted numbers of cattle and sheep and poured unknown millions, maybe billions of dollars worth of gold and silver and gems and cloth into this temple. And then when he dedicated that temple, he prayed in 2 Chronicles 7 and fire flashed down from heaven and ignited the sacrifice on the altar and burned them up. And now in Acts 2, 
God comes. And the fire comes on the living, breathing sacrifices of the new church. And they don't die. But rather, God makes his home in them. I mean, can you believe it? Like, these men and women, they know what's happening. And they are the temple of God now. And the church is something brand new. Something incredible. Now the temple of God are the humans who love and believe in Jesus. And you just can't miss the depth of this because it is such a big deal. Romans 12 says we're to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And that is literally happening in Acts 2. You, if you believe in Jesus, you are the temple of God. He lives in you. Please, please don't discount that. You are the temple of God. Stand in awe of the fact that God himself has you as his temple. It's so deep and it's so magnificent and it's so uncommon. And we run the risk of missing it because we've always known, well, God lives in you. Yeah, I know that. No, don't miss it. It's one of the biggest things in scripture that God has made his home in you. He used to live in a tent. Then he lived in a temple. Now he lives in you. I tried to think of a good discussion question for this. I couldn't. I just wanted to, I, I thought we need to worship God for this. So I'm gonna actually get my guitar and, uh, and we're gonna sing, I stand in awe of you. I think you need to stand. If you're in house churches, I know it might feel weird, but like honestly, this is a this is a big deal and we're going to have to cut because it's out of tune. You are beautiful beyond description. Too marvelous for words. Too wonderful for Like nothing ever seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom Who can fathom the depths of your love You are beautiful beyond description Majesty Thanks. I just think that there's really sometimes when, when words, you can't, can't say enough. And, and singing does something different. And so thank you for joining me there. And these men and women, they knew exactly the deep significance of what was happening here. I, they're Jews and they know their history and they know the symbolism that fire has. And now that fire has fallen on them and they are the new temple of the new covenant and that just explodes out of them. They are weeping and laughing and jumping and they're just ecstatic about what is happening. They've been praying it together for 50 days. They've missed Jesus. Jesus left them. They were left standing, looking up into the sky and wondering, are we ever going to see this guy again? It would have hit them so hard to watch their Lord and Savior, who was just resurrected, leave. And now the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus himself, has come and is dwelling inside of them, and they cannot hold it in. One thing I've noticed in myself is that I'm, I'm a pretty somber worshiper of Jesus. I'm, I'm quiet. Like I'm a loud guy, but I'm not putting my hands up and waving them all over the place and jumping. And it's just, it's just not me. And that's what I'll say, right? I, if, if someone says, why don't you do that? I'll say, well, you know, it's not really me. That's, that's for other people. And that's just not how I'm comfortable doing it. 
But you know, like I, I often think about that and I, I self-reflect a lot when I say that. And sometimes I think, yeah, it's partly me. It's not me. I'm not the big, you know, hands up, jumping around kind of a person. But why? Why is often a question I ask about that. And I think it's partly because I'm missing something in my relationship with God uh, that, that I'm not, I, I still have growth, right? Like it, sometimes I'm concerned that I know more about God than I know God. And that affects my emotional response to him in singing and in, in worship. What do you think? I, I'd love it if you talked about that. What's the difference between knowing God and knowing about God? Do you think that that could affect the, the way that we worship Jesus? Okay, back into the Bible now. These men and women couldn't help behaving the way that they did because the God that they knew, the spirit of Jesus Christ, who they walked with and they talked with, just moved into their hearts and filled them in a special way. And they're seeing fire above one another's heads and they just erupt with happiness and joy and excitement. Have you ever seen those videos when a military man or a woman comes back and they surprise their loved ones? Like their loved ones had no idea they were coming. And then they turn around and they see their loved one. It's incredible. The, the response is incredible. It makes me cry every time. I think it's like that when the Holy Spirit comes. God comes home and he's in his new temple. And it's such a deep and amazing feeling coupled with the power that they feel. The Holy Spirit comes and he doesn't just come, he comes with power. And these people pour out onto the streets and they tell everybody in every language available about the amazing things that God has done right there and right now. Because, and then they're just shouting and yelling about how amazing God is in totally different languages and everybody is hearing it. This filling of the Spirit gave them the ability to speak in these different languages for the purpose of sharing with everybody in Jerusalem at the time the amazing things that God has done. And it truly is amazing. These folks, these ignorant Galileans, pour into the streets and, and these other people start coming because they can hear their language. They can hear it. They haven't heard that in Jerusalem. They haven't heard it from anybody else other than the people they came with. And so now here are these rough country hicks who are speaking perfect languages, maybe even better than they can speak them. And they're astonished. And they look around and they go like, what is this? What does this mean? And there is literally no better question to ask here right now, back then or right now. The people watching knew something incredible and deep was happening here. These men and women were filled with something that was clearly from God. There was no way around it. There was no way you could escape that. And they had to ask, what does this mean? When you study your Bible, that is for sure one of the best questions you can ask, by the way. What does this mean? And how does it apply is a very crucial one as well. But these people look around and they go, what does this mean? And let's move that to today. We are going to study what does this mean for the next couple of weeks as far as a biblical sense. But what does it mean right now? When I look around, looking at COVID-19, I ask myself, what does this mean? And I know that all of you have as well. And I have the same answer, that, that God is calling the church and all people to himself by using the opportunities provided by this virus. We have an opportunity to return to God, to refocus on God, to remake our lives so that they're pleasing him and not pleasing ourselves. We have a chance to do what he wants us to do in a different way. We have a chance to focus on that like we've never focused on it before. That's why we as a church have held back on meeting as a big group because we want to make absolutely sure that God is the one who is setting the vision and the direction for Park Avenue Bible Church. We don't want to just do what we feel good doing. We want to make sure that it is absolutely God's leading. That's why we've held back on meeting as a big group. Not simply because we don't want it to just be what we want. We want it to be what God wants. And we know that it's been so hard to not be together in the same space. And we, when we can't see each other and we, we can't worship together that we, the way that we used to. 
However, by gathering together in homes, we've been able to up the intimacy of our gatherings. We get to know each other better. We can start showing love to one another in ways that we haven't done before. And we're still worshiping God together. We're still not giving up meeting together as, as some are in the habit of doing, the way Hebrews says. We're just doing it differently. And I thought, if I thought we were displeasing the Lord by what we were doing, we would stop immediately. But we're not displeasing the Lord. We're meeting together and we're spending more time in his presence. And we're fellowshipping deeper with one another. And we're eating together. And we're growing in relationship with Jesus. We are using COVID rather than getting used by COVID or getting abused by COVID. And we want to help you be a part of a house church. And we want to help you worship the Lord as best you can during this time and grow during this time instead of shrink during this. All of the programs that we've helped to set up are, de are designed to do that. All we're asking for you to do is be able to bend and flex a little bit during this time. And I know we're tired of being asked to do that. In virtually everything in our lives, we've been asked to bend and flex these days. But in the case of our walks with Jesus and looking at the vast change that the Holy Spirit brought to these believers here in Acts 2, I don't think that what we're asking now and what we're trying to do now is too much to ask. The changes that COVID has brought to our society are hard and they're difficult, but they need not be that way for the church. I honestly believe that most of the things we've had to give up in our expression of faith have been more traditional than commands from God. And I'd actually like you to take some time and discuss that. Has COVID stopped us from worshiping and obeying God? Or has it stopped our preferred way of worshiping him? What do you think, why do you think traditions are so hard to give up? So as we wrap up here this morning, I just wanted to tell you about one other thing that really stands out to me, why Acts 2 impacts me so much. And I think it's that, that these men and women, these 120 believers, they know God. They knew Jesus during his time on the earth. They got to see what he was like. Imagine walking with Jesus. That's walking with God, literally. They knew what God was like because they knew what Jesus was like. They felt his love. They had a relationship with him. And then he left and they were grieved. And then he came back and he came into all of them. There's a saying I picked up reading a book and that is that the spirit beside you, sorry, that the spirit inside you is better than the Jesus beside you. And that's true, right? Because Jesus was only able to be in one place at one time. But the Spirit is in us, all of us. And he's just as much in me as he is in you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And so these men and women who really knew Jesus, they literally knew him and they missed him because they were walking with him and talking with him and loving him and being loved by him. And that power of the Holy Spirit hits them and it just bursts out of them. And it's so amazing for these people and they're empowered and they're excited and they praise God all day that day. And it wasn't just because they knew about God. They didn't have as nearly as much head knowledge as I do about God, but they knew God. They knew him. They walked with him. They talked with him. They didn't have all these books and documents that I have, but they knew God. They had a real relationship with him, and that just poured out of them the day that the Holy Spirit came. Folks, we're the church. This is our birth story that we read about. And now we're 2,000 years older. And I think that for many of us, that 2,000 years, even the fact that a lot of us were born into the kingdom of God, none of these people were born into the kingdom, right? These guys were all brought in at, the, at a middle-aged point. And they knew what it was like before, and they knew what it was like during and after the Holy Spirit came. It's different for us. And I think that for many of us, that tongue of fire, that boldness, that excitement has faded. And so I, I need to tell you, at the end of this sermon, right now, wake up. 
Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you the fire and the boldness to share your relationship with God with everybody around you. It doesn't matter what they believe or what they don't believe. The Holy Spirit is literally inside of you. Use that. Use him. He promises to help you. He's your guide. He's your counselor. He's your comforter. Tell somebody about that. Meet with them and let them see what the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ mean to you. How special your relationship with Jesus is. You have the Spirit inside you. And he promises to help you to do the work that he has given to you. Don't waste it. Don't throw him away. Don't think, well, it's not just, it's, it's just not me. It is for you. He is for you. He is in you. And you have the same spirit that these men and women did. Some people have a gift for sure from the spirit for sharing their faith. But every single man and woman who has the Holy Spirit inside of them can share. At the beginning of this message, I asked the moms and the dads to share a story of when their kids were born and how God was involved. And in that same spirit, I want to ask the rest of you, after the service is complete, would you be willing to share a story with your group of a time that God did something amazing in your life? This is a way to worship the Lord as we end our service today in thankfulness and joy, remembering what he's done. That's what we've spent this whole sermon doing is remembering the amazing things that God has done. It's that day. This is a celebration day. We're remembering the time that we were born as a church. Let's end the service on a high note. Let's remember what the Lord has done for us. Something amazing that we can give glory to God for, just like those disciples did when the Spirit moved into them. This is a way of strengthening and spurring one another on. We are the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Let's move with God. Let's move against the enemy with confidence, praising God the way that the men and the women did on the day the bride of Christ was born. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We're so grateful that you came in with, as the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts, that we are the new temple and that we are the testimony to Melford and to the rest of the world of, of what you've done and who you are. May we live into that. May we be filled with boldness and confidence and joy to share what you have done. Lord Jesus, we love you and we're so grateful that we are your children. Help us to worship you as we share together. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Have a great week.